Um, hi, I'm Dan, and today I'll be presenting our work um, studying matrix and the cryptographic vulnerabilities we found whilst doing so. This is a joint work between Martin, Sophia, Ben, and myself. So first of all, what is matrix? Matrix is a secure federated platform for communication, um, and they have a bunch of different apps that they kind of that are powered by the matrix standard. This is Element, which is one of them. Um, and overall, they, they have around 80 million users. And that includes a number of European governmental organizations and their militaries. Um, so it's quite popular. Um, and not only that, but they also try to solve, I would say, some, some interesting problems. So first of all, they aim for secure group messaging in a multi-device setting, scalable to thousands of devices, and they allow kind of management of all those cryptographic identities, as well as out-of-band authentication for those identities. They allow kind of backups and secret sharing um, and all that kind of jazz that's needed. And then also, they're federated. So Alice can have an account on one home server. Bob can have an account on another home server. And they can all communicate to one another. On top of all of this, oh, sorry. On top of all of this, they also um, kind of work across a bunch of different platforms. So they're really trying to solve some interesting problems, and they're also, they are quite popular, and they're used in interesting and high-risk environments. But despite all of this, the cryptography in Matrix hasn't been well studied up until this point. So um, let's take a look. This is kind of the overarching architecture of Matrix. It's composed of like a few different sub-protocols that kind of come together to create a secure group messaging protocol. Um, first of all, we've got the cross-signing framework, which provides cryptographic identities for users and their devices. And coupled with this is the verification framework that allows out-of-band authentication between them. Um, so here we have Alice, and Alice has a key hier hierarchy with a master cross-signing key, which is used to sign a self-signing key and a user-signing key. The self-signing key is used to sign all of her per-device keys. Um, whilst the user signing key is used to sign other users' devices and keys. So, for example, here's Bob. Bob also has a key hierarchy, and when they communicate, they're going to do some kind of out-of-band authentication using, their using the verification framework. And once that's complete, they're going to sign each other's master keys using their user signing keys. And this is the kind of cross-signing part of the cross-signing framework, and it provides a nice kind of signature chain from each device all the way up to each uh, of Bob's devices and vice versa. So you get like a nice trusted mapping from real world identities to device keys. Once we have this mapping, we can then create secure pairwise channels between these devices. And that's what the OWN protocol provides. Um, you can think of this as kind of a signal derivative um, where they use triple Diffie Hellman for the initial key exchange, and they combine this with a double ratchet for continuous key exchange. Um, this protocol isn't used for actual messaging. It's just used as like a, an underlying signaling layer uh, for the other sub-protocols. So next up is MegaOM. Um, MegaOM is what is used for actual kind of encryption of user messages. And the way it works is it, there are a bunch of like secure one-to-many channels that are composed together to create a kind of a group chat. So here we've got Alice, Bob, and Claire. Alice is going to set up her own MegaOM session, which has an inbound part an outbound part, and like a signature over the inbound part using the outbound part. She's going to distribute these keys using individual pairwise channels over all, and then Bob and Claire can decrypt them, and they can associate the inbound session that they get that can be used for decryption with the owner of the OM channel they sent, that, that it was sent with. So in this case, it would be Alice. And if Bob and Claire do the same thing, then we get this nice situation where everyone has a session used for sending, and as well as the other members inbound sessions that they can decrypt messages with. And now we get a kind of a group chat. On top of this, when Alice adds a new device, she wants to share the history and her old messages with the new device. And this can be done using the key request protocol. Um, and these, these, they do this by sharing kind of um, these inbound mega ohm sessions, but over the ohm protocol. The mega ohm key backups protocol is like a, a layer on top of this that is an asynchronous alternative where you're effectively just backing up these keys using a shared secret. The final part of the puzzle is the secure secret storage and sharing protocol, which allows kind of backing up 
recovery and sharing of user-level secrets rather than these mega-ohm sessions. So this might be Alice's cross-signing secrets. And there are two parts. The first part is kind of like a secure backup, and the second part is a kind of request response protocol over ohm, so over that underlying layer. So now we've kind of given you a, a whistle-stop tour of matrix. We're going to go through our attacks. So we found six attacks in total. Five of them were practically exploitable, and we implemented proof of concepts for attacks two through five. Our proof of concepts all were um, developed against Element and the reference libraries that the Matrix Foundation provides. Um, and in doing so, we kind of we do utilize quite a few kind of implementation-specific bugs. So let's take a look at them now. So the, our first attack is regards to kind of the server's control of who is in a group. So the way they manage group membership in Matrix is just by sending messages. So maybe Alice says, I'd like to invite Eve. But these messages, unlike user messages, aren't encrypted and they aren't authenticated. So it's pretty trivial to just forge them. So here the home server can say, oh, I'd like to invite Eve to the group. And now Eve can decrypt, can decrypt all the messages that the group sends. Um, so this isn't like a fancy attack. Um, you know, the other members can see in the member list that this extra user has been added, but nonetheless, it's kind of a, a hole in the protocol design. Our next attack works against the out-of-band verification protocol, and in particular, the user-to-user -user case. And the way it works at like a high level is that, say, Alice and Bob here are doing out-of-band authentication. Um, they're going to be shown the string of, um, like a short string of emojis that they can compare out-of-band. And this protocol kind of aims to guarantee that if these strings of emojis match, they've got a kind of tamper-proof channel between them. And they can use this tamper-proof channel to send some key signing requests. So Alice might send her master signing key, um, the public part of her master signing key, to Bob for him to sign as part of that kind of um, that cross-signing process we saw earlier. But I think one thing that's interesting here is that you can see on, the, um, on that message, there is a user cross-signing key, but they've also included a device key, even though it's user to user. And this is kind of a hangover of, the, um, of a previous version of this protocol, but we're going to use it in our attack. So here, Bob is saying, yeah, I'd love to sign the keys. Um, one, another thing you can notice here is that the device ID, we haven't really mentioned it before, but this is a home server controlled value. So the home server, if they're mounting attack, can kind of insert values into, the cross, into these key signing requests. Um, additionally, the device identifier and these cross signing keys share a namespace. There's no domain separation between them. So the home server can do something sneaky and construct a string that looks like a valid device identifier and cross signing key. And when Bob gets this key signing request, what Bob's going to do is his client's going to get a bit confused, and it's going to sign the device, key, the, the device identifier, thinking that it's Alice, Alice's cross-signing key. And so you end up with this trust relationship where Bob has used his user signing key to sign the root of Alice's cross-signing hierarchy, but it turns out that it's actually Eve's cross-signing hierarchy. And, she, and that now they can mount an active man in the middle attack. Um, and yeah, so this kind of is a complete break of the protocol, but um, at kind of a higher level than maybe, say, the secure messaging channels. Um, the next three attacks are kind of build iteratively upon it, one another, um, starting with, uh, with some impersonation attacks, and we end up with a confidentiality break. So here we've got the key request protocol in its normal state. So this is like a normal execution where Alice has two devices. Her first device receives a message that it can't decrypt. So it asks one of her other devices, hey, can I have the decryption key for this? Um, the other device will say, ah, yes, um, you can have it, because you seem, you seem like one of, one of Alice's devices. I just need to do some trust checks. They'll encrypt this alongside a little tag to say who, this, who the owner of the session is. So in this case, it's Bob. Um, but when Alice receives that message, she won't do any checks. So actually, in our attack here, all Eve needs to do is send one of these messages without prompting. Um, claiming that, say, a session she's generated is owned by Bob, and Alice will be able to decrypt these messages and attribute them to Bob. Um, but there's a bit of a caveat with this attack, which is that all messages sent through this key sharing, key request protocol are flagged as kind of less trusted or um, kind of like as forwarded keys. So we'd like to improve upon that, and that's what our next attack does. So here we have Alice, Claire, 
and we have Eve impersonating Bob using our previous attack that we've just done. So this kind of partial impersonation attack. And one thing, we, the, uh, one thing that's interesting about MegaOM is that the initial key share, unlike the key request protocol, um, these, are, these key shares are sent over OM and they're fully trusted. They're not counted as like a forwarded key. But we only have an impersonation, impersonation attack that, um, that breaks at the mega ohm level, not the ohm level. So in this attack, we kind of craft a special ciphertext that looks that confuses the client into thinking it's kind of like an ohm message. And in particular, we construct a new session called B star that um, um, that we do an initial key share on and encrypt using our previous impersonation attack. Um, and the other devices, Alice and Claire, will decrypt it and start to associate messages sent using that, that session as if they came from Bob, but not marked as forwarded. So this gives like a, a kind of full impersonation without any caveats. We can then build upon this one more time. Um, and we'll recall that the secure secret storage and sharing protocol uses OM for this kind of request response. Um, sharing of kind of user level secrets, and one of those user level secrets is the key that the mega ohm key backup protocol uses to encrypt inbound sessions and kind of back them up to the home server. So here we use a similar impersonation attack and protocol confusion to kind of um, forcibly share a backup key that we've set, and the target will accept this key and start to back up all the mega ohm sessions they have access to. Um, using this key, and we can decrypt it. Um, so overall, our attacks kind of touch all these different protocols, these different sub-protocols, but they mostly work on the interaction points between them rather than like breaks of the particular protocol, like um, the insides of the protocols. Um, oh, cool. So yeah, they solve some interesting problems, but there are still some pretty difficult problems. I think they're problems that are worth solving. Um, and I think they can be solved by, um, I th I th yeah, I'll just move on. Um, cool. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, Daniel, for the talk. Any questions, you can find the microphone that I'll turn on. So one question, did Matrix fix any of these things? Um, do they know how to fix them? They fixed a quite a few of them. Um, the first attack hasn't been fixed yet, so that's the... Um, the server control of group membership. Um, and that's just because I think it's in the design processes. Um, but the majority of the other attacks have been fixed. Um. Go for it. Yeah, I guess a small question. I'm curious, um, in this case, you are attacking a particular implementation of the spec, but also looking at the spec. And I'm, I'm curious like, how you went back and forth between those two things during the cryptanalysis process. And also, like whether that has any implications for how we should go about ensuring that the spec is secure, which is maybe different than ensuring that an implementation is, is secure. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So we started off just um, just studying the specification, but I think a lot of specifications these days, like I think I make this mistake as well. Like you try to write a specification that's like covers all the bases, but in reality they never do. Um, and so. What we ended up doing is looking at the implementation to fill in any gaps in the specification. And it was usually when there was a gap in the specification where we looked and there was a similar gap in the implementation. Um, and I think maybe trying to look at kind of machine checked proofs and those kinds of things can force you to have a kind of someone over your shoulder who's like a more pedantic version of yourself to make sure you do fill in all those gaps. Do you imagine writing those proofs about the spec or about a model of the implementation? Um, about the spec, I would go for personally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have time for one more question. If you keep it very short, um, kind, of, kind of a follow-on to that. Uh, was there any formal analysis done in the design of Matrix, or was it just kind of ad hoc and crypto engineering? Um, it was mostly ad hoc kind of uh, crypto engineering, I think. Um, thanks. 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 Let's thank Daniel again. Thanks.